So right now we're talking about the iron sharpens iron. If you've been to some of these um, events in the last two or three years, then you'll know what this slot is all about. This is the slot when we open up your brains with a mental tin opener, give your brains a bit of a stir, a bit of a whisk, a bit of fundamental rewiring, a bit of challenge thrown in there as well, and see if you survive the journey. That's what we do. It's a bit about challenging accepted notions of right, what is necessarily right or wrong in teaching and what the scriptures really say and so on. And we try and pick themes which are current, topical, sometimes even themes which are challenging us within Masonic Judaism, themes which we want to actually challenge others with outside of Masonic Judaism. But the idea really of these slots is to take you a little bit deeper because it's the meat and milk scenario we are all used to having the milk and we get this day after day and it keeps us going and so on, but we just want to throw in a little bit of a bit of meat here, a bit of a steak, you know, throw you in here and just kind of feed you with a bit of meat and get you to think a little bit. And the topic today for scrutiny is the one new man. The one new man. There it is. Just who is this one new man? doesn't matter what Mass Science Jewish website you go to, and many others besides, some of whom are actually working against Mass Science Judaism, I have to say, it seems to be this concept of the one new man is springing up wherever you go. Everyone trying to justify positions with their, their ministries and so on with this. Many Christian sites, I have to say, beginning to wake up to the emerging presence of Mass Science Judaism and are reaching back and I say advisedly back, you'll see why in a moment, reaching back to this model of the one new man to undermine the growth of Messianic Judaism and challenge our theological assumptions. They think by talking about this one new man that they can do us harm. Because, of course, we are well aware that uh, within Christian teaching, we are beginning to put pressure on certain concepts, shall we say, whether it's Shabbat and other things as well. But we are here, we are bringing pressure on both sides of this, towards the Christian community on one side and towards the other non-Messianic forms of Judaism on the other side. And I think, therefore, the time right now is right to challenge this concept, to challenge this pronged attack back on us of this one new man. You know the passage, I'll read them to you in a moment, but this whole thing about there's neither Jew nor Gentile and so on. And so it's often said back to us, there we are, you see, you don't have to be a Jew. Seems quite simple, doesn't it, right? And there are whole ministries being built on this and teachings being disseminated on this. Why Messianic Judaism is wrong and so on and so on and so on. Well, of course, it is time to take a stand and we're going to in this iron sharpens iron slot this afternoon. Let me just read you some of these passages. I'm linking them together. They are, if you like, a conceptual midrashic whole. So you need to link them together and try to understand what Rav Shaul is saying through all of this. Here we go. First one, of course, is in the letter to the Jewish community in Galatia, and it's chapter 3, uh, 26 to 29, where it says this, For you are all sons of God through faith in Yeshua Mashiachenu. For as many of you as were immersed into Messiah have put on Messiah. Therefore there is neither Jew nor Greek. Or let's translated as it should be translated right from the beginning there is neither jew nor gentile because that's what it actually is there is neither slave nor free there is neither male nor female for you're all one in messiah yeshua so all enjoying being eunuchs yes i thought you were if you're not one yet we can talk about it afterwards okay if you are messiahs then you are abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise we leap forward to chapter 6, where this astonishing statement is made by Rav Shaul. For in Messiah, Yeshua, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. What a staggering statement to make on the face of it. And again, we know you hear the verse and you can hear people saying, it's not about circumcision, do away with it, do away with it. Well, then you've got to do away with uncircumcision as well. Ah, didn't think about that, did you? Right? So it can't be what you think it's saying. There's got to be something else going on here. The last one I want to read you is in Ephesians 2. 
Uh, the whole of chapter 2 is excellent, of course, but I'm just going to pick a little bit out of this, starting at verse 11. Therefore remember that you who were once Gentiles in the flesh, that's you were Gentiles before you were born again, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. At that time you were without Messiah when you were a Gentile, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once far off, Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, broken down the middle wall of division between us, there's the key word division, we'll come back to that, having abolished in his flesh the enmity of the law of commandments contained in ordinances to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile both to God in one body through his execution thereby putting death to the enmity preaching to those afar off and to those who were near and so on and so on the key bit there is the one new man but it goes down to verse 22 it's all good that whole chapter is good these passages all belong together this whole one new man neither Jew nor Gentile and so on and so on they all belong together in this this new creation as Rav Shaul was trying to hint at now, I think the first point up is this. You don't need to be a rocket scientist when you look at these verses to realize when you put them together this way, the context for all of this is salvation, or more specifically, the result of salvation. This is not achieved without Yeshua. This is a fundamental point to understand in this passage, of who this one new man is. Whoever this one new man is without Messiah, it is impossible to be it. It has to be through him. That's so obvious in many ways, but we'll come back. You'll see there's a reason why it's important later on. What is meant by the circumcision or uncircumcision, something new? Well, again, is there now an alternative to circumcision or uncircumcision? I've never heard of one. I mean, you're the one or the other. You're not a bit somewhere, what, what men, excuse me. You know, I mean, what, uh, well, yeah, all right, you work it out, join the dots. I'm not going to put a thing up on the slide, you know. You can't, you've got to do one or the other. Right? Although apparently the Egyptians were partially, but let's not go there. But, you know, you've got to be one or the other, right? You've got, you can't kind of sit in the camps on this one. It really doesn't work. So if there's no alternative, what is Shoal talking about? Who is this one new man? Because he's neither Jewish nor Gentile, he's neither male nor female, he's nor slave nor free. We are all one. All the differences are gone. And, of course, in many ways, you know, he's right and yet... When I look upon the room here, I see men and women. Did you stop being a man when you were born again, men? Did you stop being a woman when you were born again, women? No, I think you've probably carried on. I mean, if you didn't, come and let me know. I'll be interested to know how that works. But as far as I'm concerned, you carry on. But this verse is saying there's neither male nor female either. So there's got to be something deeper here. There's got to be a point which is not being got hold of. Shaul knew what he was talking about. The question is, do we know what he is talking about? That is always the issue, of course. Distinctions, apparently, seem to have gone. And yet, isn't it strange, with these distinctions that have gone, the one message which goes out to Jewish people is, come and join the Gentile body of believers. How weird is that? Apparently distinctions are gone. Oh, no, they haven't. Come and join us. Stop being a Jew. Well, how about you stop being a Gentile? No one's asking that question. No one's putting anyone on the spot on that one. Join the Gentile body of believers and have a ham sandwich. Now we're all one new man. You know, it's what the mind reads and understands, even if the words don't say that. Of course, this may have worked a hundred years ago. But the nuances, frankly, of a crass view like this are causing it today to blow apart. More research has been going on, more study has been going on on an academic level apart from anything else. That these somewhat, shall we say, simplistic views really can no longer hold sway. As we've said so many times, if the Jewish-Gentile distinction is gone, then so has the gender divide and so has the slave and free. Now you may well say, yes, Rabbi, the slave and free distinction has gone because of Wilberforce historians, yes, Wilberforce and the historical abolitionists and so on. But we're still men and women, last time we checked. 
but there's something else here. Why should the movement, in terms of being born again, why should the movement be towards joining a Gentile body? Why is it not the other way around? Then we'll stop for a second and ask this. It all seems so obvious if you're a Gentile, but it's not if you're a Jew. It is not obvious. And I think all of this reveals, to some extent, the depth of the unsaid, unspoken theology and ideology that drives these statements. And these dichotomies that Scholl picks here are not random. They are purposeful. And we have to understand what he's saying. These are not throwaway comments. They are critical to the overall understanding, as we will see. Who is this one new man, this new creation? Got to understand it, we've got to get back to our first century Jewish mindset. Of course, as in all things, if we're going to appeal this back and see where we're going for it. What were the competing views, the different philosophical, ideological, theological agendas and angles that were at work in that first century? The contexts and backgrounds of the passages that we've just read. Most recent research on this is pointing now to an understanding behind especially Ephesians and Galatians that actually Scholl was writing against a resurgent Gnostic and Gnosticism of his times. Now, if you're not sure what Gnosticism is, in a nutshell, we would probably describe it today as a kind of hyper or super spiritualized attitude towards Scripture. Hi, you know, Gnostics, Gnostics are the ones who know, you know. Um, it's like um, when there's, you know, the, the, you get adverts about some um, spiritualists and, and so on, you know, and, and you know, come and see so and so and so and so. And you think, well, actually, you know, if you were really in tune with that, you'd know anyway, wouldn't you? Because you would know, right? It's like Gnostics. Gnostics are supposed to know. But apparently, um, yeah, they know, but you don't, which makes them somewhat special, of course. And this is what Gnosticism is all about. It's not scriptural Gnosticism. But this advantage of being the only truly spiritual ones who would know what was going on here meant that they could take the reality of the, of the uh, terminology, if you like, of the scriptures, the physicality of the terminology of the Bible, and use it at will in any way that they deemed necessary or as they wanted to. Let me ask you the question. If you could play with terms as you want to and super-spiritualize them and make them mean what you want them to mean, how easy is that leap from that to replacement theology? It's about that close. It's very easy, because at that point you can say, you know what, that's not that anymore, it's this. Suddenly you can say, ah, oh, Israel isn't Israel anymore, it's this, it's this Gentile body over here. Well, how do you know that? Well, I know. Yeah, I know. I'm not joking, by the way. This is, I mean, I, I, I jest, but this is historical. Gnostics genuinely believed they had extra knowledge. And they applied it in this way. And it was a real problem at this time for the understanding of Scripture, to really understand what was happening. And behind Ephesians and Galatians, we've got this robust defense from Shoal against this kind of super spirituality that is going on. It's very easy to see how this Gnostic attack was beginning to influence the scriptural interpretations, to be whatever you want it to be, frankly, however you felt led for it to be, and Shaul says, no, that is wrong. So the Gnostics were saying that after being born again, you somehow transcended the purely physical to a higher spiritual plane, leaving behind the fleshly distinctions of this world. And you see, this is where it gets interesting, because for them, Yeshua was not necessarily Jewish. He didn't need to be Jewish anymore. In fact, to be Jewish was too worldly, fleshly, carnal. No, this Yeshua the Gnostics were teaching was a universal spiritual being who may have taken flesh to save us, but in essence was, was and is an idealized, ethereal, ethical image and universal icon. Ring any bells? You know, people talk about today Yeshua cults, but this decontextualized Yeshua that is often taught in congregations, not in Messianic Judaism, but outside. This should worry us because this is exactly what the Gnostics were teaching. And hidden away in all of this is a lot of critique against Judaism, in particular Messianic Judaism, and about this one new man. A sad drift towards a decontextualized anti-Hebraic view of Yeshua as a universal goodwill ambassador from heaven. 
And if such is true for him, then it was true for believers. Then he didn't need to be Jewish. In fact, all of these old categories just seem to fall aside because they were too carnal, too worldly, too fleshly. We didn't need them anymore. You suddenly become this sort of super spiritual what's it that just, yeah, glides through the ether. Whether you're male or female, Jew or gentle, slave or not, is it irrelevant? Your quality of your spiritual life was all that mattered and your hearts and everything else. And uh, so you just kind of float through. And we have to remember this is what Rav Shaul was preaching against in his letters. He was saying it is important terminology. In fact, the deliberate image and usage of this terminology of Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave and free and so on was important and it was actually to contrast his position with the Gnostics as many experts now believe he was doing. He did not super spiritualize any category. In fact, one thing that does become clear for Scholl if we read his writings is that he's saying something profound about real and existential categories that for him do still exist. In his day, they still existed. And he wasn't getting rid of them. He was talking about them in real terms. But what he was saying is that these categories of Jew and Gentile and so on in Yeshua have undergone a transformation to a deeper reality. It's still physical and real, the distinction's not gone. It's still male and female people, but they are transcending categories while maintaining their physical reality. There's something deeper going on. We reject this spiritualization of humanity, which the Gnostics were teaching if somehow the categories aren't important. They are, but they are being transcended. It happens through Yeshua, whatever it is, but just to abolish them as if they don't exist is wrong. What does he mean? What does he mean in all of this? The answer, I think, as I was beginning to question all of this, because having read now some books about this and websites like a lot of you have, I'm sure, and becoming more and more confused, frankly, by what I was reading, I thought, you know what, I need to do some research. It kind of brought me to this point of putting this talk together. And the answer, I think, actually is quite radical and may shock some people maybe not here but certainly i think would shock people outside in the believing world to answer the question we have to go back and look at some of the as we say modern and not so modern views on all of this Scholl's own words three pairs jew gentile male female slave and free accidental no as i said within that first century torah mindset these categories are important in fact, Rav Shaul saw in these pairs a fundamental creational divisional structure, hence division, which he talks about here in Ephesians. That's creating different sets, if you like, of people. These pairs of polar opposites were everywhere to be seen, framing Shaul's social and personal world. And his key point for us right now is he saw humanity divided. The major divide that he saw, and the first pair up in all of this is Jew and Gentile. Humanity divided. Those who are Jewish and those who are not. The other two pairs we'll come back to in a moment. What is really, really important here is that Rav Shaul, as the Jewish man he is of that first century, radically backs up the Jewish position, and I say this the Jewish position today, that mankind is fundamentally split into two groups, and not three, or more, but two. Within the Jewish thinking, the nations the Torah talks about are a conglomerate of all the peoples but who fundamentally do not belong to Israel. There's Israel, and then there's the nations. That is basically your divide on the planet. When God chose and called Abraham, he initiated a divide, now making a separation between those people, a people group who are his, and those who are not, those who he has called and chosen to follow him and those who currently are not following him. And scripture is full of this distinction, light, dark, clean, unclean and so on. There's always this, this polar distinction that runs all the way through the scriptures. There's Israel and there's the nations. Really important, get hold of this concept, show backed up this. And I've heard people say this to me, to my face, 
that the nations at the planet and so on is not split into two, it's split into three or more. I want to make this absolutely clear from Shaul's perspective here. He understands that it's split into two, Jew and Gentile, male, female, slave, free. He sees these polar opposites as divisions within humanity. All are made in his image, whether you're a man or a woman, Women, would be glad to hear that. You're made in the image of God too. We don't get into chauvinistic things here. Slaves are made in the image of God. Doesn't matter who you are. You're all made in the image of God. But one group, Israel, has been tasked with a heavenly cosmic plan to reveal God to the nations. As a human being, you're either in one or the other, but you are not in both. Get it? You're not in both. It's not circumcised and uncircumcised. It doesn't work. You're either in one or the other. You're either male or you're female. <laughs> you're a slave or you're free. Right? But you can't, you know, you, you, these are fundamental creational divides that Shaul is seeing here. You can't sit on the wall. Might be a bit painful to sit on the wall if you... <laughs> never mind. Um, okay, you have to... <laughs> you have to decide and know where you are vis-a-vis your standing with God. It's important. It's why even today in Jewish thinking the word Gentile is synonymous with being a pagan, a heathen, someone who doesn't know God. This is really critical because people will come to you and say, I'm a believer, I'm, I'm a wonderful Gentile. You say that to someone who is Jewish, they're going to scratch their head and go, then you're not a Gentile anymore, are you? Gentiles are the pagans, the heathens. They're out there doing idolatry and goodness knows what out there on the streets. And you're saying you believe in the God of Israel? Then you, the what? They don't get it. It's not in the Jewish mindset. It's not in the Jewish framework of reference for humanity on this planet. To be a goy, Gentile in Hebrew, is someone who has no connection with God. To one of the nations, goyim do strange things. Because they're not part of us as Israel. It's part of who and what they are. As Israel, our vision and our calling, our task is to shed the light of the Lord abroad and win some over to us for the one true God, because there is only one God. Ah, some of you are thinking Romans, aren't you now? Did you get the link, yeah? Yeah, we'll come on to that in a minute. Why is this split so important? It is because the early church fathers began to bring in a theology that fundamentally challenged this view, and in more recent times has been rejuvenated and connected to this one new man idea to attempt to combat Messianic Judaism. See, driven by a need of their time, politically and otherwise, to be seen as separate from Israel, the Jewish nation, the church fathers began to develop a concept that flew in the face of what Torah and Rav Shaul taught as the basis of humanity and its structure. Aware of the obvious problems in identifying believers not born Jewish with Gentiles, because they were aware what the concept was, And due to the prevailing views well known amongst believers and Jews at the time, the church fathers began to suggest that a third way was possible. It's a bit like new (laughs) labour. A third way, right? There's another way of doing this. Not really Jewish, not really Gentile, but a kind of, yeah, you know, it's somewhere in there, a third way. Not Jewish, not Gentile, but... Christian, is what they said. And the advantage of this new category, of course, meant that all previous concepts that attached to being a Jew could be removed, and likewise also being a Gentile. You weren't a pagan anymore, you could happily eat pork, as you weren't Jewish either. So you kind of took this third line. And this idea of Christians being a third race, which is really important to what Scholl is talking about here in terms of this one new man, This idea of Christians being a third race is expressed in a letter to Diognetus, a tribute to Justin Martyr. If you want names and facts, we can give them to you. 130 CE by Barnabas, quote, Yeshua prepared for himself a new people. Clement of Alexandria, this is a bit later, 215 CE. Clement taught that the believing Gentile and Jew have been raised to a higher unity of a third people. There it is. Clement quoting Matthew 18.20, where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them, said, this goes on to prove that there are three groups on the planet. (laughs) Really? (laughs) I don't get that from that verse, but never mind. But apparently it does. 
Jerome goes further saying, Jews are Gentiles in spirit and only in flesh Israelites. Oof, ouch. Did you hear that? This is getting painful now, isn't it? You can see how the church fathers and their anti-Semitism were already getting into places they really shouldn't have been getting into. He then concludes, we Christians rather than Jews are the members of the Commonwealth of Israel. I don't think that's what Rav Shaul was saying in Ephesians, was it? I think you, you, know, you know the passage. That's clearly not what he's saying. From now on, to be in the Commonwealth of Ephesians meant that Jews had to become Gentiles or discover their, quote, real selves who could go on and we could go on and go on and get the point of all this, but I think you get it. The church now was a third way, a third race or group of people. People were to be converted out of Judaism and converted out of Gentilism and into this new body, the church. And it all seemed to make perfect sense of this Ephesians 2.11, stating that, of course, you were Gentiles. That's what the scriptures say. And it has to be said, at least the church fathers recognized the importance of that verse. At least they got that right. They knew that if you were born again, you weren't a Gentile anymore. At least they still were getting that back in the early, well, first and early second century. If you were a believer, you were no longer a Gentile. But today, frankly, even that nuance has gone. People don't even bother anymore. They're just quite happy to talk about themselves as believers, as Gentiles. If you were a believer, however, you were this one new man, the third way. This new path which God apparently had established apart from Israel, apart from the Jewish people. And so I said, this verse in Ephesians about the one new man is now being given a retread, brushed down, revived in our day. The third way again, the higher unity of Jew, ex-Jews and ex-Gentiles in Yeshua, reaching back to the early church fathers, in fact, for inspiration to combat what they see as an overtly Jewish Messianic Judaism. Well, I make no apologies for saying this is Jewish. It's called Messianic Judaism. It's what it was in the first century. It wasn't Christianity. It wasn't anything else. It was a Judaism. But it's obviously getting a little bit too close to home for some people today. And so this whole concept of this third way, this one new man being revived today, is no longer being Jewish, no longer being Gentile, but being something nebulous in the middle. Well, then, so you are not male or female, you are going to be something nebulous in the middle. You can't have one without the other. Be logical, be consistent, or throw your paradigm overboard and start again. But you can't have it both ways. To the untrained eye, of course, this third way looks suspiciously Gentile, which of course it is. It's the same old story, come and join us, have a ham sandwich. But it clearly can't be what this one new man is all about. Well, before we get on to what it exactly is, I just want to just state one more little thing about this, which I think is really important. It's terminology, but terminology is important. Whenever Israel is being used in the scriptures, it's talking about Israel, it's talking about the Jewish people. Equally, when you read in Greek, ta etne, the Gentiles, that phrase always means Gentiles, not the non-Christian world as the church fathers would have liked us to believe which is what they redefined that term as. The Gentiles means those who are not Jewish, pagan, heathen peoples. The Torah and the Messianic writings do not envisage another group or people or race. The historic and prophetic calling of Israel was to be the people of God by descent and by the ongoing election of God, conversion through Mashiach. And our calling was to share with the nations the goodness of God and seek for them to join us. There is no other group. There is no mystical plan B in case Israel went wrong. It's exactly the core concept that we see in Shaul's olive tree argument. There is how many trees? So there is. There are how many trees in Romans 11? One. Not two. If you belong to God, then you're grafted in as a wild branch or continue to grow if you are faithful as a natural branch. But there is only one tree. There's not a third tree, a middle tree, or whatever. There's no taste the difference branch. Neither is there, this is not a natural branch, nor a wild branch, but a Marks and Spencer branch. (laughs) In fact, Shoal said to be clear, 
Do not boast against the branches. He didn't even need to say, don't plant your own tree. He wouldn't have even had a concept of that as an idea, that that was ever going to happen in history. That would have been bizarre and unexpected. He said, don't boast against the branches. Didn't need to say, don't plant your own. So this is really where we get to, to answer the question. The physical is real, the dichotomy is real. We see it as fighting a Gnostic influence upon the interpretations of the scriptures. We've seen the response of the church fathers in all of this to create a third way, a different way, neither Jewish nor Gentile as the one new man. That doesn't work either. No planting your own tree. We have to get back to actually some core ideas within Judaism itself drawn from the scriptures to really understand what's happening with these Jewish Gentile male female splits and the one new man. What do we think? Okay, here we go. Are you all with me still? Yes, you're not asleep yet. That's good. Here we go for a bit of brain frying. Now, I just want to say at this point that, of course, you know, these, these iron sharpened iron things is really to get us to think. I want you to think. All right? I'm not saying thus saith the Lord. I'm saying think. But I'm going to draw upon some Jewish concepts in all of this, which hopefully might help us get there. What does he mean? No, one new man. Well, the enigmatic passage again, just read this to you. This is uh, 6.15. In Messiah Yeshua, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Okay, we know the passage. As we said, we've understood. People have said that Rav Shaul here is doing away with circumcision. No, he's not. Doing away with Jew Gentile. No, he's not. That's clearly, he's not doing that. We have to try and understand what he is saying, and it depends upon this term. What does matter is the new creation. This is obviously critical to Shoal's argument. So therefore, we need to understand what he's saying with this. For whatever this new creation is, it transcends the current divisions of humanity and assigns them to history. Where it really becomes interesting, and this is the bit of revelation, I think, that really unlocks this, is the word new. Because, of course, as we know in Hebrew, and we often say, we talk about not the new covenant, but the renewed covenant. Okay, you've got it. The whole concept here, already we can then begin to say, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters, but what does matter is the renewed creation. Now we're already into slightly conceptual different territory now, aren't we? But this is what the Hebrew mind is thinking. So there's something about this renewed creation that transcends the human divisions, but what is it? More prevalent in Jewish thinking down the ages has been that this core idea of renewal, redemption, salvation, restoration of that which was lost. It's a core message, in fact, of what Judaism is. God is our salvation. That which is lost, you bring back and restore. Yeshua said it with the parables, the sheep and the, and the, the, the lamb that went astray, and so on. It is core thinking to Judaism. We bring back that which was lost, the core foundation. In fact, the Jewish thinking teaches that in the Messianic age will be nothing other than the restoration, the full restoration of what it was like to be in the Garden of Eden. A return to the perfection of the beginning. Eden restored is the renewed creation in Jewish thinking. It goes all the way back to the beginning again. Back to perfection again. Back to that full renewed state of where we started from before it all started to go wrong and people thought eating fruit was a good idea. <laughs> By the way, it's not. Well, that's my view anyway. I think fruit, fruit lands you in all kinds of troubles, as you can see. This idea of the renewed creation, absolutely for sure, I believe, is what Shoal is talking about in this passage. This is the Jewish concept he's reaching back to. Salvation brings restoration between God and man, man and man, and in mankind itself. And you immediately get the connection now with the circumcision and uncircumcision doesn't matter. You know, in, in salvation terms, it doesn't matter. It actually doesn't. Being born again is more important than your starting blocks. 
What matters here that what Shaul is saying, what matters is that ultimately as this step of being born again is a step towards Eden being restored again in the Messianic age. You see, in Eden man had a relationship with God. God walked in the garden. It's a close, intimate relationship. How many of us have ever had that kind of relationship? How many of you walked through your back gardens and had God come and stand next to you? It's not happened to me. Not that, you know, he would speak to you, where are you? in that way that we read at the very beginning. In Eden, man was not at war with itself. Man was not at war with its environment. Through all of this, through Yeshua, all of this would be restored, he says. It's the start of the Messianic age as he expected would happen, and in Judaism we have known, in fact, for a long time would happen. And here it gets quite interesting. Irenaeus quotes an interesting prophecy Um, I'm going to quote this to you because you may not have made this link. It really kind of blew my brains out a little bit. I'm going to read it to you. This is Isaiah chapter 11. You'll know the passage, but it's so good it's worth reading. Picking up from verse 6. This is a prophecy of the end time. And uh, Isaiah says this, The wolf will lie down and dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and young lion with the fatling together. A little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play with a cobra, or the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in a viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Did you notice the context So the earth is full of the knowledge of God? This is talking about the Messianic age. This is referring to all mankind. And in the middle of all of this in Isaiah 11, we have this strange list of here of all these animals behaving in a rather unnatural way. Well, of course, it's referring to the Edenic condition back in the garden again. What is not obvious, and only became obvious as I was digging through the research on this, was this, in fact, is the background to Kepha's vision in Acts 10. Sheet coming down. Animals, Right? Now, I hadn't made that link before, but it kind of blew my brains out when I started thinking, whoa, you mean that, what? Yeah, you begin to suddenly get it, what Kepha's going on here, because in fact, to bring a restoration of these animals in this way and linking it back to this passage of Isaiah 11 is actually talking about a restoration of humanity, but we have a problem in Kepha's mind, don't we? What is Kepha's problem at this point? He's looking at his animals, and what's his reaction? Unclean. And effectively, the Lord says to Kepha, no, you are wrong. You are wrong. Because these people have the image of God on them too. And they too can respond to, to me, says the Lord. But it's in line with Irenaeus' quotes here, citing ancient Jewish views, that this animal picture is a picture of the nations being restored at peace with each other and at peace with God. It's a return to Eden that Judaism in the first century had developed such a disliking for the nations and classified them as unclean was therefore a huge problem because it meant you would be instinctively against sharing the good news with the nations. That's a problem because it's something you need to do. Israel's core mission was to reach out and therefore this view of the nations as being unclean in this way and not to touch and not to go near was a self-imposed barrier to the inclusion of the nations which was our core vision and aim as Israel and as Jews. This is about full restoration. And in fact, you could think something much bigger than full restoration. It's a return to the perfect state of the beginning of it all. And we shouldn't be surprised that this is the ultimate goal and the drift of all history. For the Edenic template we have is fundamental to understanding God and humanity, in particular two concepts. One, every human being carries within him or herself the image of God. Every human being. Doesn't matter whether you're born Jewish or not, the imprint of God is on you. Fundamental to understanding this. Secondly, that mankind has monogenesis. What I mean by that is that we arose, were created in one place, and all humanity is derived and descended from an original pair of humans, Adam and Chava, 
who subsequently propagate that image. And the implications of this is this, these profound truths are not lost on Rav Shaul. It's why he makes the arguments in Romans, which comes back to what I was saying earlier. This is the key bit here where he's at pains to make this clear. He's beginning to understand this. This is Romans 3 and uh, 20, this is 29 and 30. He says, is he the God of the Jews only? And of course we think, no, of course not, because God is God. Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Is he not also the God of the nations? Can he not be the God of them too? Clearly he can. He says, yes, also, of the nations too. They too can come in. They too can respond. Since, and here comes the rationale behind this, God is one. who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith. He's not saying don't get circumcised, he's just saying there's only one way to get saved, and that's by faith. Right? But he is making clear something quite fundamental in all of this, that God is one. And if God is one and he is the only true God, then guess what? The nations, where are the nations going to go for their God? Who can they go to? There is only one. They've got to go to him. There's no point us as Jews saying, no, 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 he's our God. He's the God of Israel. Go get your own God. There are no other gods. It's a crazy statement to make. And Shaul sees this. And he's not having any truck with this. He says, no, no, he's not just the God of the Jews. He's the God of everyone. Has to be, because God is one. Okay? So it's important that we all have the image of God, all of humanity... And if God is one, then he has to be the God of all. Because we all have his image. So you see, monogenesis and monotheism go hand in hand. The two hang on each other. If, on the other hand, evolution were true, and mankind arose spontaneously in different parts of the world, like the jawbone found in Ethiopia last week, which now apparently tends to suggest that there was another spontaneous arising in Ethiopia, then the pagan idea that each nation has its own God could be true. If evolution is true, paganism is true, actually. Two go hand in hand. You may not have thought of that before, but they do. But Shoal is at pains to make it absolutely clear. God is one, mankind is one, because we all descended from one pair of parents. Now, you may not like your great 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 grandparents and you certainly have an issue with what your great 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 grandmother did with the fruit in the garden but they're still our parents all of us so we're all related by the way hi i'm your cousin but we are and you see instinctively we kind of know this don't we yeah we do doesn't matter what country you come from you kind of know this is this is the beauty of actually being human the Ephesians 4, if we go back there again, um, again, Shoal is trying to make this point really, really clear. This is uh, Ephesians 4, and uh, picking up here, verses 4 to 6. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one immersion, one God. And fire. He's going, one, 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 one. Don't you get this? There is only one. Yeah? And if there's only one, then it's only going to be one truth in one way. You know, she has said, only you come to the Father through me. There is only one. One is it. Right? It's all about one. Given the unity of God, we must be one too, but not only us Jews, he says. Then everyone, we all have to eventually become one. If he's one, he must be the God of all. He can't just be this parochial deity of the Jews. And that is why in Judaism... The Jewish view of the end times ultimately is an inclusion of every human being into this understanding of who God is. Now you can begin to understand. Do you remember? No, I'm going to read this to you. This was, um, we said it this morning, but I will just repeat it to you now. This is in the Alenu. And we say this, and we may not be aware of what we're saying when we're saying it, but every time you say this with the Elenu, we are declaring this. As the Torah says, you shall know this day and reflect in your heart. It's the Lord who is God in the heavens above, on the earth beneath. There is none else. 
We hope, O Lord our God, to soon behold your majestic glory when all abominations shall be removed, all false gods at an end. Then shall the world be perfected under the rule of the Lord Almighty and all mankind shall call upon your name. There it is. We say it every Shabbat. We're declaring the same truth. God will reign over us soon and forever and on that day the Lord shall be one and his name. We say it every week. Look, this is not communism, because this is what people tend to think, nor is it some romantic liberal doctrine. It's Torah, it is Jewish thinking. Mankind unconsciously knows this to be true, which is actually why I believe such humanist attempts to create an artificial unity of mankind are ultimately doomed to failure. We know it should be true, we're desperate to try and make it true, but it's going to fail. Why will it fail in man's effort? Because God is not doing it. And it's not his way. It's his way or no way. Because there is no other third path. By virtue of creation, God is the father of all men and all mankind. Therefore, all men are my neighbours, all people are my brothers. Mankind redeemed and restored is the vision of Judaism and recorded for us as we know in Revelation and elsewhere. Do you know that verse in Revelation? The leaves on the tree in the book of Revelation are for what? The healing of the... Oh, well, there we have it again. Because it's all coming together. And let's not forget, the divisions of the nations was a curse imposed by God to stop mankind attacking heaven and becoming too powerful. Now, think of it this way. If a curse is placed upon mankind, which has created these artificial divisions amongst us, then the curse can also be lifted in as much as judgment can be lifted too. And I believe in Yeshua, through salvation, we see a way that that begins to happen. In fact, to the Church Fathers' credit for once, because I want to be balanced here, to their credit, they saw and they wrote in their writings that when congregations had a mixed multitude of nations in them, they saw this as a clear reflection of this one restored humanity all coming together again. And they said that a congregation, in, even in their day, in the first and early second century, a congregation of such mixtures was a healthy sign because it was a real signal of what truly was going on within the Jewish mindset and understanding the family of God coming together. The unity of God and the universe, unity of mankind, therefore, is a fundamental given of Torah and Judaism. In fact, uh, we can see this picked up elsewhere. I'm going to go to Corinthians as well. Uh, while we're there, I am getting towards the end. You'll be pleased to know, but bear with me. We are getting there. And this is 1 Corinthians 15, and picking up on 21. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah all are made alive. Okay, And then we zoom forward again to 45 to 49. Here's another critical concept. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, or the second Adam, as is also translated, became a life-giving spirit. The first man was of the earth, made of dust, the second man, the second Adam, is the Lord from heaven. The second or last Adam is who Yeshua is. And it's this Jewish idea that Mashiach would be the one to restore Eden, who would in fact be a second Adam, who would bring back full restoration of mankind. Just as mankind was corrupted by the first Adam, so too in the second Adam, mankind, can mankind be redeemed. Now you begin to get this idea of what Shoal's talking about when he talks about putting on the renewed man. You need to get back to this re restoration pattern and restore the sense of creational humanity with its relationship restored to God. And it only happens when you're born again. Interestingly enough, I just want to just mention this in passing as well because it's again an interesting concept. The rabbis taught that the body of Adam contained all of humanity in it with each nation being a different part of the body. So they attributed nations to parts of Adam's body. I'm not going to go into details. It's quite humorous reading. As you can imagine who they chose to be the head and the foot and other parts of the body. We won't even go there. But as you can imagine, they were allocating according to how they felt at the time. Needless to say, Israel was the head. 
okay, but this is Adam. But the concept that's been carried over for us into the Masonic writings, because what does Scholl teach? We are one body. Someone is an eye, someone is a foot, somewhere, yeah, you know the passage? This is Jewish Midrash. This is ancient Jewish Midrash about Adam. Oddly enough. Which now begins to make sense because if we are all parts of the body, now it's, this is humanity restored. Being born again, being inspired and filled with the Ruach, the Spirit of God, now means you are, in a sense, almost back in the garden again. You are a renewed second Adam and you are all different parts of it functioning as a body. They're all links together. The m- bigger picture is, a, is quite an amazing picture when you see it this way. To be a part of this body is the first fruits of a future full restoration yet to happen and I say yet to happen because we are not at perfection yet why is it that people struggle with this verse about neither Jew nor Gentile and so on well really it rides over human categories that we still see as operational but you have to go deeper go back further to really get it why is there no Jew and Gentile in Yeshua why because in Adam there wasn't a Jew or Gentile now you may think to yourself, obviously Adam wasn't Jewish. Well, he wasn't Gentile either. He was humanity. Adam means mankind. It's not a name. It only became a name later on. Adam is mankind. Not Jewish, not Gentile, because there were no divisions. It was just mankind. Yeah? Okay, if you get that idea, then what about, uh, what about male and female? Was Adam male or female? Mankind? No, he wasn't. He was androgynous. Ah, you begin to see where Shaul was going with it now, yeah? Was Adam a slave or free? No. He hadn't made any moral choices up to that point, and therefore he was technically neutral. He wasn't in bondage, nor was he free. You can only be free if you choose freedom and take responsibility. Now you see why Shaul was using these categories when he was talking about this one new man, the renewed man, the new man. It's a restored Adam. Because in Adam, none of these categories were true. It was just him. There was no division in mankind, no division in humanity. He was just Adam. So what Shaul is doing here He's picking up on this ancient Midrash to talk about the plan of salvation to restore all of humanity, not just the Jewish people. But before you think now, oh, that's great, this means it can be non-Jewish and decontextualized, I think you'll have got the hint, that is not true. This is a future condition of mankind. We aren't there yet, but it will happen. In Yeshua, Shaul recognized this final stage had begun, not just with Israel, but now all humanity were beginning to respond to Yeshua. The nations were pushing in. And he saw in this the fulfillment of this ancient Jewish dream that all mankind will be impacted by the God of Israel. A full restoration of the Garden of Eden again. Everyone could be saved. Everyone would worship. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Yeshua is Lord. Amen? Amen. All mankind. It's quite a radical vision. Transcending the borders of Judaism and yet not getting rid of it. It's an inclusion. It's future. Right now, our role as Jews and as Israel continues, as it's always been, to reach out to the nations and preach the good news of Yeshua, our Messiah, and the salvation he brings. The God of Israel is the God of salvation. That's our role. That's our calling. Right now, those distinctions are still functional. We're still men and we're still women and we still are these things. We have to reach out and include. But ultimately, what Shaul is saying through these verses here, the one new man turns out to be the one renewed mankind. That's what it is. One renewed mankind. Back to the Eden again, back to that state of perfection, back to the beginning, and all of this is only possible, how? In Yeshua. And only in and through Yeshua. Do you see now why Ephesians talks about breaking down this this wall of division? Because ultimately it goes. There are no more walls of division. They all go because of salvation. So no third way, no extra group or race, 
just a fully restored humanity back to Eden, the one renewed man in Yeshua. Amen. Avinu Makeno, Father, I just thank you for this afternoon. Father, I thank you for the words. Thank you for the revelation. Thank you for the teaching, Lord God. Father, we just trust that you continue to speak to us and uh, teach us from your scriptures. Father, we thank you. You do give us enormous revelation from your scriptures as we're rediscovering that the Jewish scriptures run from Genesis to Revelation, that all of this is Jewish. It's, it's Judaism and it's part of what it means to be born again and to walk with you in these days. Father, we just pray that this talk will cause many to think to pray, to study, to get deeper into this, Lord. Father, we want people to uh, have the right tools to discern the Word of God. And Father, we just pray, Lord, right now, that you will increase this in our midst, in our communities, Lord, a hunger and a desire to know truth and not be put off by platitudes, not be put off by theologies that have been around for so long that no one dares question them anymore. Father, I pray, make us truth seekers, and not stop until we find it, we pray. Amen.